Thank you so much, and hello everyone. I am Laura. I'm going to be talking about the human creative director. So I'm talking today about artificial intelligence in the human creative process. I'm really hoping that you all aren't AI'd out by now and that you can stick with us for a couple more talks about AI. Um, so AI, like many creative, um, many tools before it, is changing the creative process. And my research actually focuses on AI recommendation systems. So the underlying algorithmic systems for platforms like Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and so forth. And we know that these platforms have become the primary sites of engagement with creative content, right? They're where we all go to see creative works. They're where creative trends proliferate where people learn how to use new creative tools, where new creatives are discovered, and ultimately today, where a lot of creatives are earning a living. And so these AI systems are determining what is rendered visible, and they're thereby becoming our cultural gatekeepers. It's something we were just talking about in the last session, right? Um, and so they're taking up the role of the museum curator or the gallerist of, of the past. Um, now, these museum curators and, and gallerists of the past typically belong to these elite institutions, and they tended to be people of the global minority, as, as Sasha mentioned this morning. So there was a lot of excitement when platforms like Instagram came into being because there was this idea that we could democratize access to creative content, that people from the global majority could share their creative work, and we could all access it and see it and appreciate it. However, there's so much creative content available, and that's increasing by the day. And so that content needs to be culled down somehow. And now we're relying on these AI systems to curate that content for us instead of the people from uh, these elite curatorial institutions of the past. So essentially what we've done is we've shifted that curatorial power from the hands of the elite arts institutions into the hands of these elite tech companies, the big tech behemoths of today. And that's something that I would like to prom problematize um, in this talk. So perhaps, taking a few steps back, perhaps you remember the good old days when Instagram actually showed us images from the people that we chose to follow in the order that those people posted those images? It seems like a crazy idea now. Um, because first, Instagram changed the order that those images and videos were shown to you, uh, placing at the top of your feed um, the pieces that it thought you were most likely to engage with. They love that idea of engagement, right? And then, more recently, Instagram started showing you images and videos from people that you did not choose to follow. Um, and those in images and videos are chosen by AI systems, right? So um, what you can see here is that Instagram has announced that in this very year, they will double the amount of AI-selected content that appears in your feed. It may have already happened, for all that we know. Um, and what that ends up causing is this interesting feedback loop that I've observed in my research, where these algorithmic decisions about what to show to who when directly influence creative practices. So in my research, I've had the pleasure of talking to everyone from small-scale TikTok creators to these world-famous artists that are shown in, in the most famous museums and blue-chip galleries. And they've all admitted to me um, that these AI curators, as I call them, are influencing what they create. Now, this could be at the more simple level. Um, what you see on Instagram influences the piece that you end up making later that day because you've been inspired by, by the Instagram content. But it could also be that what you see on Instagram informs your view of what the art world is today, what sort of content is, is trending and acceptable and selling. And then the last way that, that um, Instagram and these algorithmic platforms are influencing creative practices is most interesting and also the most terrifying to me, which is that creatives are starting to admit that sometimes they're making pieces that they think will perform well on the algorithmic platform, right? So they're saying, I think that Instagram's algorithm is gonna like this and therefore give it an audience, so that's why I'm choosing to make this. And in this way, the algorithmic decisions are directly impacting what is being created by creatives around the world. So I have an example here of a friend, um, artist Max Zestkov, and I talked to him a couple months ago about how Instagram has impacted his practice. I want to share his story with you. He makes these beautiful 3D spatial immersive pieces. I highly recommend that you check them out. And one day, deep in the pandemic, um, as many of us did, he was working late at night on some new creative projects, and he made something that he thought was okay, it wasn't his best work, but he thought, hey, I'll put it out there. And he posted it to Instagram and went to sleep. 
Now, when he woke up in the morning, he had hundreds of thousands of likes, tens of thousands of new followers, and he'd experienced the modern condition of going viral. And uh, what was most interesting to Max and most exciting to him was when he checked his email, he saw invitations to participate in a couple of group gallery shows, he saw introductions to potential collectors, and so in this way, the act of going viral had actually given him newfound commercial success and financial stability, potentially. So he continued to make pieces like the one that had done so well, that had been positively reinforced by both Instagram and his online community. And as he continued to post these similar pieces, which again, remember, he didn't think was that actually exciting and creative, he kept posting them and he kept getting more and more followers and more and more likes. And then he realized, slowly over time, that Instagram is a brand building platform. And when you're building a brand, what you want to do is very clearly correlate the same type of content with your entity over and over and over again. And that's what Instagram was encouraging him to do, keep posting the same stuff. But as an artist, what you're supposed to do, at least in Max's view, is that you're supposed to post different things. You're supposed to post new things, unique things, ultimately creative things. But whenever he tried to do that, the, the platform seemed to punish him. He wouldn't get nearly as much visibility, he wouldn't get nearly as many likes, and he felt trapped in this cycle of becoming a brand instead of the artist that he wanted to be. So when I talked to Max uh, back in January, he said, you know, if I really want to be an artist, if I really want to be creative, I need to give up Instagram, I need to stop using it. Now when I checked Instagram this morning, Max was still active, so... <laughs> I think we all know how hard it, hard it can be to go dark on these platforms. So I've talked a little bit about how um, creatives change what they produce because of these algorithmic platforms, but I also want to talk to the flip side of that, which is how viewers change how they perceive and how they interact with artworks in algorithmic spaces. Um, so here, this is a, a paper with a colleague of mine, where what we found is that in online algorithmic context, people change their viewing behavior. So we told people to, hey, look at some artwork that you think is interesting, that you think is creative, that you think is good. And what people came back to us with were pieces that grabbed their attention or that caught their eye. Now, this is very different from how we might interact with creative content in a museum. I don't walk into the Tate and say, I'm just gonna look at whatever pulls me in and grabs my attention. Instead, I go around to each piece and I look at it individually, I look at its materiality, I think about its meaning, I question how it was made, I maybe appreciate its aesthetic beauty. But in the online algorithmic context, we've been trained to be a part of what scholars call the attention economy. Some of you may have heard this term. And in the attention economy, there is a bunch of different sources that are competing for our attention through increasingly multi-sensory, increasingly surprising, full-screen experiences, right? You don't have to think much further than Instagram's original, very simple white cube design that has now become the full-screen, audiovisual, immersive experience that is TikTok today. And so because we have trained ourselves in these ways of looking that are oriented um, according to the attention economy, the aesthetic uh, sensibilities that we've developed in online algorithmic contexts have changed. The type of artwork that we appreciate in these contexts is fundamentally different, right? So that is ultimately shifting cultural norms. So you can't have a talk about creativity and AI without, of course, mentioning the elephant in the room, generative AI. I think many of us are familiar with that word now. Um, and this has really brought the question of how AI is influencing creativity into the public domain. Um, I am at least grateful for that, that we're all starting to think about how AI is shaping creativity. Um, and there's been a ton of headlines and lots of debate, some at this very conference, about whether generative AI is the harbinger, the end of all human creativity, or whether it's a newfound creative frontier that's unleashing new possibilities that we could never have imagined before. My personal view, which I share with some of the other speakers here, is a little bit more nuanced. Generative AI is not the beginning, nor is it the end. It is a new form of creative expression. It's a new tool in the artist's toolbox. Now, the existence of this new tool in the artist's toolbox changes the role of the human creator. And that's what I think is important for us to consider and for us to discuss. So that's what I want to focus on a little bit here. So up on the screen, you see the sort of old linear creative process, the one many of us probably know and love or know and have a love-hate relationship with. Um, and this process is changing given the existence of generative AI. 
I've highlighted in the center here this moment of production, this moment of actually making the thing, and this is where we might imagine some disruption. You could imagine that this moment of production is replaced by generative tools, and that might render skills like drawing or painting a little bit less unnecessary. Some of you may be familiar with the work of artist Memo Atkin. He's a collaborator of mine and recently told me that he thinks drawing may go the way of long division, right? It's a skill that we're all taught in school, that we all fundamentally know we should know how to do, but when it comes time to actually do really complicated division, we tend to reach for our devices, right? It's a skill that we, we don't practice very much anymore, and Memo thinks that it's quite possible for painting or drawing to go in a similar direction. Now, I want to be very clear here. The role of the human creator is still integral to creativity. And you can see that uh, when I put just the word creator into Dolly, this is what it gave me. So even the generative tools know that humans are creators, which is great. Um, but let's look at how, how that human role of creativity is changing. So here I've outlined the new creative process. Now there's a lot of changes to this. I won't go through all of them, but you'll notice some of the previous um, ideas like iteration and ideation that we used to be so familiar with at the beginning of the creative process are updated for the AI age with terms like direction and curation. And that's because generative AI produces ideas in high fidelity right from the start of the workflow, right? So it's up to the human to direct and select those ideas, but the human doesn't actually have to do the sketching out of those ideas anymore. Now, we could have a whole other conversation about conversational interfaces and whether text input really is the right way to represent visual ideas. And I'm, I'm hopeful that um, there will be new input modalities that include sketches at the start of the creative process. But that's a conversation for another day or perhaps the Q&A. Um, but what I want to focus on here is where the human creator is most involved today. And I think that in the context of generative AI, this is where human creators will be focused. Um, so in the past, the human creators may have been very focused, many of you, very focused on the moment of production, the moment of making the thing perfectly. And then after production, editing it, editing it to get it just right. But now instead, we see this focus more on the origination and direction and curation, right? So they're focused much more on coming up with ideas and deciding among an array of ideas. So in this way, the human is becoming responsible for certain parts of the process that still require uniquely human skills. So specifically, what humans are focusing on are these two ideas of direction and selection. And when we think about these ideas of direction and selection, those are quite similar to sort of curatorial practice. So you could say that human curators, human creators, sorry, are shifting into curatorial roles. But let's take a step back and think about how this works technically. Technically, generative AI works by producing a latent space of all these possible images. And the human is responsible for directing that system. And in directing it, the human is essentially aiming a lens on a certain part of that latent space of images. And they're doing this through prompting, usually right now using words. So once the machine produces a subset of images that correspond to that prompt that the, the human director gave it, the human then chooses amongst those images. So this is the selection component. And then ultimately, it is the human who directs how, when, and where that selected image is going to be displayed. So all of this together forms a process of curation. Now, conveniently, we humans, we're pretty good curators. We love to select from a given array of options. And many of us could pretty confidently deduce a, a rhythmic tune from a random array of notes, but far fewer of us could actually produce that rhythmic tune, or at least I certainly could not. So as humans, we have this taste, this sens sensibility, something that I believe is far too subjective for a variable-based mathematical system like an AI to have. So as we look to the future, I think that the creative skills of the future that we need to focus on fostering are the curatorial ones, because high-quality imagery can be produced with the snap of our fingers. It's curation that moves earlier and earlier in the creative process, and artists become curators. It's our human discernment, our taste, that will become the most sought after creative skill of all. Now this has really interesting downstream implications for how we teach creativity, the ways that we organize creative labor, and the tools that we use. But in that spirit of individual personal human subjectivity, I thought I would leave you with some additional provocations to consider yourself. First, how would you describe your taste to a machine? And actually, how would you describe your taste to a fellow human? 
How do you decide what creations you see today? How much control do you have over your visual ecology? What would art made for a machine curator look like? And how would that be different from art made for a human curator? What would you make if you didn't have to physically generate it? And who is empowered by these new forms of creativity? And who needs to be protected? Thank you. <laughs>